this man is in a battle for survival. His company builds some of the fastest, best handling, most expensive cars on the planet in a Europe-wide mega factory. His latest design, a million dollar race car for the road, is make or break. Now he needs to build it, market it and sell it or his dream is over. The Gumpert Apollo. Just 60 have been made. A hand-built, two-seater, mid-engine German supercar. Built for speed. It's more competitive race car than road car. Engineered to be as reliable on the streets as it is fast on the track. This car is really, really extreme. To be honest, this is a race car with number plates. Gumpert Sportswagen is just under a decade old. The brainchild of this man, Roland Gumpert. His vision is simple, to make the fastest road car on earth. The aim was to beat Lamborghini, Ferrari, Porsche, everything that's out there. But even with race car performance, Roland Gumpert wants his cars to be reliable enough for daily use on public roads. The idea behind the Apollo was, I take the car, I can drive it from the factory to the racetrack, I'm in the same league as the racing cars, and maybe even faster than them. To get these cars approved for the streets, they must comply with strict European tests. I must never ever forget that I'm developing a road legal car. We run crash tests, emission tests, child protection tests, side impact tests, pedestrian impact tests. We've fulfilled the lot. Life isn't easy for a small independent car company. It costs millions to develop, test and produce a world-beating supercar. Even the big players, Aston Martin, Ferrari and Lamborghini, often struggle. Roland Gumpert knows this well. For over 30 years he was at Audi, where he became a high-flying executive creating some of the fastest cars on the planet. But his ultimate dream was always to build his own supercar, free from corporate interference. All my life I've developed cars, but this was a project to build a new factory from scratch, without any restrictions. Now he's alone, with a personal fortune invested in his own small company, based on the top floor of a former Soviet-era sewing machine factory. A hundred and eighty kilometers south of Berlin, in the town of Altenburg. All Gumpert's cars are made here. 
by just 40 full-time staff. And that includes the cleaner. The entire company is crammed into an area not much bigger than an Olympic swimming pool. But this is no threadbare operation. Up here, there's a production line, a weld shop and a small store. These rub shoulders with offices for design and administration. Roland Gumpert's office sits alone. This might not be the mega factory you think of when imagining where a supercar like this might be built. But for production manager Mark Fritscher, it's the perfect location. And gleichzeitig is this. It's relatively easy to set up production here. It's less expensive than other sites in Germany. And above all, there are some very highly qualified personnel in this region. Porsche and BMW have factories just up the road, so skilled auto technicians are plentiful. The Apollo is a highly engineered machine that requires skilled and passionate people to build it. A single person can never develop an entire car. One always needs a team. And a team spirit creates new ideas, and that's the beautiful thing about it. For a boutique manufacturer like Gumpert, hand-building just a few cars a year, it's not feasible to spend millions designing and manufacturing components in-house. Instead, Individual parts are sourced from 60 European suppliers. From as far as England to the north and Italy to the south. The company exists as a Europe-wide mega factory with the Altenburg assembly plant at the center of this web. It's an impressive feat of logistical organization. This is the ultimate, just-in-time, bespoke build. Of course, at the beginning, lots of people laughed at me. It'll never succeed. But thanks to God, or with a lot of luck, I managed it. It hasn't been plain sailing. To build the right car in the right way is only half the battle. The other is to sell it. And the last few years have been tough, as Bastian Schiefer, head of marketing, knows only too well. We had orders there, definitely, but then with all the economic crisis, financial crisis, we lost a few. And if, if you're just selling 20 cars a year and you just lose, let's say, 10, it's just 50% of the whole revenue, so it, it can destroy such a, a small company. The company almost went bust in 2010. Only money from investors saved Herr Gumpert's dream. There were so many incredible low points. We were at rock bottom, underwater. We were drowning. But we still managed to swim free, up to the air. And we're still here today, and we'll be here in future. I'm absolutely certain of that. It's still a precarious existence, where every sail is vital. To generate noise in the crowded supercar market, the company's planning a new million-dollar Apollo. Weight will be reduced, power will be increased, and it will only be available in moody black. This will be an Apollo with its aggression turned up to the max. And to capture this bad boy attitude, it will be called the Enraged. This lighter it has more horsepower, it has a better gearbox, it has better cooling, so it will even beat the normal Apollo on the road and on the racetrack. To catch the world's attention, the plan is to launch their new flagship at the world's most prestigious car event, the International Geneva Motor Show. For Patrick Hopper, head of press and PR, it's crucial they make it there. It's a must to be there, just to show the world outside that you are alive, that you still exist um, in this hard business. And this is 
really a big thing for a small company like us. Geneva is just three months away. Right now, the Apollo Enraged only exists in a computer. It will be a race in itself to get it built for the show. And that race begins in the weld shop. Like every Apollo, the Enraged starts life as 211 separate chrome molly steel tubes. Chrome molly is a lightweight steel alloy that's twice as strong as ordinary steel. Its lightweight strength makes it ideal for building aeroplanes, oil rigs and supercars. The tubes are laser cut and welded together to form a space frame. The structural core of the car. It's a design concept little change from the race cars of the 1950s and so effective that modern day supercars such as Audi's R8 and Lamborghini's Gallardo still use it. The Apollo space frame is built in sections on templates known as jigs. The jigs ensure that each section is built to a precise specification. Accuracy is vital. A tube that isn't perfectly aligned or welded could weaken the frame. A failure at speed would be disastrous. With the main subsections built, they're brought together and welded in one huge mega jig. The whole process takes two welders a month. As head of Audi Sport, Roland Gumpert helped create a legend, the Audi Quattro. Roland Gumpert was brought in to mastermind the operation within what had to be a very sophisticated team. The Quattro was revolutionary. It was the first rally car to have four-wheel drive and blew the opposition away, winning four world championships and 24 world rally races. Having beaten the world rallying, Roland Gumpert wanted to win again on tarmac. He quickly realized that handling was the key. But this time he'd maximize grip using aerodynamics rather than four-wheel drive. If you have a project and a silly idea in your head, then you have to say, what aren't the others doing so well? Race cars use aerodynamics to generate downforce to improve their handling. This, Roland Gumpert believed, was one trick other supercar manufacturers were failing to use to their best advantage. Downforce is the aerodynamic force that can be used to push a car into the ground at speed. It's the exact opposite of lift, the force that allows an aircraft to fly. This downward pressure gives the car more grip, so it can accelerate quicker, corner more aggressively and brake harder. My dream was to have a car that has so much downforce at high speeds, I can drive straight along the roof of a tunnel. In 2002, Roland Gumpert quits Audi and asks former colleagues to help him build the ultimate supercar. Hans Peter Fischer jumped at the chance. As a child, he'd been inspired to become a car engineer by Gumpert's World Rally victories. 
In those days, I never dreamt I might get the chance to build a car with Roland. But when the opportunity presented itself, of course, I grabbed it with both hands. To maximize downforce, they have a bold idea. They will design a track car for the road, rather than a road car for the track. In order to achieve the best aerodynamics for the Apollo, we kept the car as low as possible. The whole vehicle is no higher than 1.1 meters, one of the lowest cars with a registration plate in the world. The ultra-low wedge-shaped bodywork is just one of the key design elements of the car that help maximize downforce. The others include slotted vents over the wheel arches, the huge rear wing, and a very special underside. Here, at the front wing, the air streams in at a height of approximately 60 millimeters, and as it travels to the rear of the car, it gets wider and wider, causing negative pressure that sucks the car to the road. As the fast-moving air rushes under the car, the increasing ground clearance from front to back causes a change in pressure that pulls the car to the road. And to keep this low-pressure air flowing under the car, they use an air curtain made by vortex generators. It generates mini tornadoes, which create a vortex trail stretching along the side of the vehicle, preventing the air from escaping sideways from underneath the car floor. Theory's fine. Now the company has to prove their car can beat the opposition on the track. The Nürburgring, Germany. Perhaps the most demanding race circuit on earth. When we started to develop this car, our ambition was to prove that we were the fastest production car on the Nürburgring. The Nürburgring's Nordschleife was the home of the German Grand Prix until declared too dangerous for F1 racing. Now supercar manufacturers use this infamous circuit's old northern loop as a proving ground to show how fast their cars are. Everyone is aware how tricky and how hard this, this track is and if you are the fastest there then no one will ask how fast you really are because it's proven that you are fast. In 2009, Gumpert arrived at the rink to prove the Apollo is the fastest road legal car in the world. It's a massive gamble. Failure or a serious crash will ruin their reputation. Both are a distinct possibility. Behind the wheel is 26-year-old professional racing driver Florian Gruber. Averaging a speed of over 172 kilometers per hour, he covers the difficult 21-kilometer course in an official time of 7 minutes, 11 seconds. The third fastest in history. It's a fantastic achievement for a small, independent company. But time has moved on. In the supercar business, you need to evolve to survive. To have any chance of grabbing the headlines at Geneva, they need the Apollo enraged. Mark Fritcher, the firm's production manager, is on the road. With Geneva imminent, he must check that the suppliers are on schedule to deliver the parts the Altenburg assembly plant needs to get the enraged built for the show. If the car doesn't make Geneva, the whole future of Gumpert could be under threat. 
Today, he's 200 kilometers south of Gumpert's HQ in the Bavarian village of Kreuzen. AX Lightness is a world-class supplier of carbon fiber components to the car industry. But as company founder Axel Schnurrer explains, it wasn't cars that made their name. It was my hobby, cycling, that led to the first bicycle saddles, manufactured on myself. The business then took off fairly fast. As well as making some of the world's lightest bikes, they also make carbon fiber parts for top race teams and companies such as Mercedes-Benz and Audi. They won the order to make the safety cell and dashboard for the enraged. This car is a step up in luxury from the original Apollos. The smallest details are important. We've made it so the patterns on the carbon fiber parts all go in the same direction. In the room next door, the car's safety cell takes shape. It's a time-consuming and costly job, so it wasn't ordered until the last minute. Now, it'll be a race to get it built. The safety cell fits inside the space frame to protect the driver in an accident. Carbon fiber safety cells were developed for the racetrack. Since safety cells have become commonplace, driver deaths have been greatly reduced. Carbon fiber for the new safety cell arrives as a flexible cloth impregnated with resin, which sets rock hard when subjected to sustained heat and pressure. First, this fabric is cut by a computer-controlled laser into 210 different pieces. Next, in a contamination-controlled room next door, technicians cover the safety cell's tailor-made mold with the carbon fiber pieces. Any air gaps are squeezed out using a vacuum bag. Before being slowly baked in a pressurized oven called an autoclave. After two and a half hours, it's taken out. The whole process is repeated a further six times. It makes a cell so strong that sometimes it's all that survives of the car in a crash. Back at Gumpert's HQ in Altenburg, the parts are starting to arrive. Mikhail Weigert and Peter Lang begin the assembly of the car. The Geneva Motor Show is less than two months away. It's going to be tight. This is the first time they've built an Enraged, and they're totally reliant on the components arriving on time from suppliers across Europe. The safety cell has arrived and has been screwed and glued into the space frame. The 120-litre petrol tank goes in right behind the safety cell, and there's a good reason why it's placed here. To centralise mass. In the enraged, the relatively heavy transmission, engine, fuel tank and driver are all positioned close to the center line of the car. 
All vehicle components are arranged so that, under all driving conditions, tank full or empty, passenger or no passenger, the weight distribution remains unchanged, ensuring reliability and good handling of the vehicle in any driving situation. The crash box has arrived from a supplier in Neuburg in Germany and is mounted at the front. It's made of specially engineered aluminium that looks like corrugated cardboard. In a crash, it's designed to collapse in a controlled way, acting like a crumple zone in an ordinary car, reducing the impact on the car's occupants. Most standard road cars have just one radiator. Top of the range race cars might have two. This car has three, one of which is mounted inside the crash box because space is so tight at the front of the car. Three radiators plus an F1 style air intake are essential to cool the supercar's monster engine. It's hand-built 320 kilometers south of Gumpert's HQ by HSB in Hüttenhausen. This Bavarian barn is the workshop garage of Karl Hasenbichler, a former champion racing car driver turned engine tuner. When Roland Gumpert needed an engine for the Apollo, it was his old race friend Hasenbichler he turned to. I always liked the, to go to the limit yeah, in my life and this was a, a, a nice project uh, to find the limit for a streetcar. In 2005, Karl Hasenbichler helped build the first Apollo. It's still in his garage today. To build a brand new engine from scratch is expensive. So to save costs, they took a standard Audi V8 and went to work. In Audi's RS6, the engine typically generates around 450 brake horsepower. In the first Apollo, they tuned it to 650. For the Apollo Enraged, Roland Gumpert wants much more. Harson Bickler's team pushed the engine to an incredible 780 brake horsepower. And there's a good reason why the Apollo series needs such powerful engines. The cars generate large amounts of downforce to increase cornering speeds. But this extra pressure will slow a car down on the straights. You have to imagine, depending on the setup and trim position of the rear wing, at 270 km per hour, we can generate up to 1200 kg. It's like having a rhino standing on the car roof. The downforce helps improve grip, but the extra weight needs a powerful engine to shift it. 780 brake horsepower does just that. Back in Altenburg, at the company HQ where they're building the enraged for the Geneva Motor Show. Operations manager Mark Fritscher is feeling the pressure. We have deadlines, so must check for every part. When you have some problems, it's not good. Four key parts are missing. The car's new black alloy wheels. 
As a quick fix, to allow them to move the car around the workshop to continue the build, they decide to fit some old silver ones. But these aren't good enough for Geneva. Mark needs to get this sorted, or the Geneva show could be off. Also feeling the pressure is technical manager Patrick Ermshire. His team has spent months working on the all-new components. Because we're a small team, we have to work on the whole car. It's not just about the chassis, the engine or the bodywork, but it's also about all the small individual parts. He's now working on an aluminium transmission adapter that sits between the car's new seven-speed gearbox and the new highly tuned engine. Like virtually every bespoke component on the Apollo Enraged, it gets designed on a computer at the Altenburg HQ, before being emailed to a supplier for manufacture. The supplier of many of Gumpert's aluminium parts is based 50 kilometers away in Gruner, a quiet residential street is the workshop of BMF. Here they make precision parts for top race teams and high-end car companies. They have milling machines that can work without supervision on up to 60 parts at a time, change tools, and even send SMS messages to the engineers when they need attention. It's the flexibility and precision that these machines offer that first attracted Gumpert. The owner is Ronnie Bernstein. We work very well with them and can always discuss changes to improve parts and materials so that they can be cheaper to make or the materials can be used more effectively. The design for the new transmission adapter arrives from Altenburg attached to an email. The machinist first creates it virtually on a computer to spot any potential problems in the milling process. Once he's happy, the machining instructions are sent to the real machine. A single block of aluminium is loaded and the transmission adapter is cut to shape. This entire process takes almost five hours. Finally, before being shipped to Altenburg, the finished part is measured to check it conforms to the strict criteria Roland Gumpert demands. Back in Altenburg, the car is nearing completion. The center shell, known as the greenhouse, goes on without a hitch. But the large gullwing doors take more work. With the doors in place, it's onto the car's interior and the carbon fiber dash from Bavaria. There's over four kilometers of wiring in the enraged, and it all needs checking. But there's a fault. The semi-automatic gearbox isn't working. At the moment, we have some trouble to flash the software to the gearbox control unit, and we, we, th we are thinking that's maybe a problem in the wiring, and this problem we are searching for. With the Geneva deadline approaching, the build goes on. The custom-built, Swiss-made $1,600 windscreen is glued into place. The team are careful not to smear adhesive on the glass. It has to be done right first time. <laughs> Meanwhile, they found the wiring fault. 
it was a simple, loose connection. Now they can bring the Apollo Enraged to life. We start the engine for the first time. That's a big point. And we will see everything is okay. And also gearbox, engine, be fine. So, great thing. Yeah, come on. With the engine running fine, the crucial aerodynamic underbody and huge rear diffuser are fitted, followed by the Apollo's F1 style air intake to cool the engine. And finally, to everyone's relief, the missing wheels turn up. And not a moment too soon, the Geneva show is just two days away. That feels good. Car's now finished. Everything's working, so good feeling. Yeah. Happy. Yes. Seeing it fully built for the first time, Roland Gumpert is very impressed. I think uh, it's hard to find a mistake. <laughs> Perfect. It's taken a huge logistical effort from 60 companies across Europe to get the Apollo Enraged built in record time. But they've done it. There's no time to relax. In 18 hours, this car needs to be 1,000 kilometers away on the other side of the Alps. in Switzerland at the 2012 International Geneva Motor Show. They've made the deadline, but now the pressure is on to sell. It's very hard for us amongst these big players because they got a lot more resources, a lot more budget for marketing. Despite the opposition, the company finds itself in demand. The initial response to the Apollo Enraged is positive. I'm just checking every half an hour my emails and I'm, I was, I'm looking what's going on in the web and it's very good. But the team are realistic about converting these good reviews into instant sales. To sell cars in Geneva, to be honest, is not very easy, especially um, a car like this. To convince people to buy a car, they need to drive it. So Geneva is always just the first step to give them an idea about what an Apollo is like. As a follow-up, the company arranged a track day at the Red Bull Ring in Austria to allow potential customers to get behind the wheel. In the rush to get the car ready for the show, a few vital but time-consuming driving tests were postponed. The first of these tests requires a specialist rig back in the Bavarian town of Fichtenberg. KW makes shock absorbers for top race teams around the world. And in their competition workshop, where cameras are never normally allowed, they build the suspension for the new Apollo Enraged. The front and rear shocks have already been fitted to the car in Altenburg. To make sure the enraged can be pushed to its limits on the track, they use KW's test rig. This is one of the few places in Europe where it's possible to fine-tune a car suspension for any racetrack on Earth without ever leaving the factory. Head of testing, Martin Malinowski is clear about the importance of good suspension. 
Also bei Fahrzeugen wie diesem ähm With cars like this, the motor is obviously important and the aerodynamics. But without a proper chassis or without good suspension, it's a waste of time. The car is rolled onto four steel plates supported by huge hydraulic ramps housed in the room below. Sensors provide feedback to a computer. The test equipment is so sensitive, a life-size dummy is used to replicate the driver's weight. The test begins by vibrating the car's wheels to gain a base level for the suspension's performance. Once the basic test routine is complete, they load the data for the Red Bull ring in Austria and run the enraged on the virtual track, allowing the engineers to gain the vital information needed to set the car up. A normal test takes between one and two days. Of course, there are very special cases. Depending on the complexity, it can even take a week. This work isn't done to give the car's passengers a smooth ride. This is about tuning suspension for maximum grip by making sure all four wheels stay firmly planted on the ground during high-speed cornering. It's a fine balance. Too soft and the car will sway around the bends. Too hard and the car will fly when it hits a bump. In both cases, it will lose grip, slowing the car down. Suspension setup complete, the car travels north to the outskirts of Altenburg, to the company's test track at Nobitz. Thirty years ago, with East Germany behind the Iron Curtain, this airfield was on the front line, packed with Soviet military jets and troops. Today, it's a quiet regional airport, where the only thing disturbing the peace are light aircraft and the occasional low-flying supercar. Nico Schnee is the engineer in charge. At these tests, we are checking all the systems if everything is running to be sure that the car is made perfect for the customer. At a mile and a half long, the runway makes the perfect proving ground. Covers on the front protect the car's bodywork from stone chips because this car still isn't sold. The tests go on throughout the day with regular stops to analyze data. Normally, the engineers would sign a car off, but the enraged is so important, Roland Gumpert himself comes down to say whether it's ready or not. That's fantastic. Super. I haven't driven something like that for a while. Classic. We should make more of these. Next stop, the Red Bull Ring, Spielberg, Austria. It's here potential buyers from Geneva get a taste of the Apollo. Three different Apollos are on hand to test. The enraged is amongst them. Current owners have also turned up to use the track and to check out the latest Apollo.
Maintenant, on n'est pas très nombreux parce que bon, la production n'est pas non plus énorme. Il y a eu 60. There are not many of us. There is, of today, just 60 cars. But over time, people will discover the car and realize it is exceptional. Il va conquérir d'autres clients dans le futur. I can jump in that car, drive to the racetrack, have lots of fun on the racetrack like today and tomorrow and then just uh, jump back in the car and return back home and it's quite, uh, yeah, just having fun on the street and on the racetrack as well. While the owners are having a great time, the company's sales team make the most of the short time they have with three potential buyers from Geneva. We have to convince them that the car is the right choice. This takes time, but in the end we think we, we can convince a few. You only know when you got the money on your bank account, then the deal is made. They have a nervous wait while a prospective owner takes the car for a spin. After 20 minutes behind the wheel, he's back and they get the news they've been waiting for. A German businessman is keen to buy. The Apollo Enraged has done its job, and it may just have saved Roland Gumpert's dream. It's been a difficult few years, but the company is fighting back. Roland Gumpert is positive about the future. Many people try to build themselves a dream car, but to actually do it and succeed by going into production with a workforce of 40 people, that's extremely rare. Our vision is that in the future we will be a sports car manufacturer like Lamborghini or Porsche. And be here in 50 or even 100 years. That's our vision.